Airbnb does say they seem to hint that more photos is better. I don't buy it. I'm more concerned about the conversion rate. So you don't have to take, I'm in my kitchen right now, you don't have to take five angles of the kitchen. You just have to take one angle that gets 90% of it in. This is episode number 39 of the Short-Term Mental Success Stories podcast. Are you an investor that's looking to have your home professionally managed? Go to cohostit.com for more information. Welcome back to Short-Term Rental Success Stories. I'm your host, Julian Sage. This is a show where I talk to hosts about their journeys in starting and growing their short-term rental business. My goal is that you'll be able to walk away with practical information that'll help you become a better host and learn how to scale your business. Like any exceptional host, we all strive for five-star reviews. So please go on over to iTunes and let us know what you enjoy as it really helps support the show. If you haven't done so already, go on over to our Facebook group, The Host Nation, to connect with the community. Hey, what's going on, Host Nation? I am super excited to be able to bring to you someone that I've been really following since I first got started in the short-term rental space. This guy, he is super knowledgeable and his blog articles on Airbnb and optimizing are really, really well thought out. But as the season is upon us, it's a lot more challenging to get bookings because everybody is dropping their prices. It's a lot more competitive because there's a lot just less traveling going on. So being able to optimize your listing is crucial if you're trying to get more bookings. And in this episode, we have the special honor of speaking with Daniel Rustin. Uh, Danny is the author of Optimize Your BNB, the highest rated and most highlighted book on Airbnb and Amazon. Danny shares just so much valuable content on how to get your Airbnb listing to the top and to increase your chances of getting booked and making more money. If you haven't subscribed to the show notes where I share my success secrets, this is one that you definitely want to subscribe today, guys. There is just so much knowledge dropped in this episode. There's there's a lot of success secrets in this episode. So if you haven't done so already, uh, go to shorttermsage.com backslash str39. But if you like my success secrets sent directly to your inbox every week, then go to shorttermsage.com backslash show notes. With all that being said, on to this week's conversation. Hey, welcome back, Host Nation, to another episode of Short-Term Rental Success Stories. In this episode, I have the special, special honor of speaking with the one and only Danny Rustin. Danny is the founder. He's the person that wrote the book on Optimize My Airbnb. It is a game changer, guys. Uh, he Previously, he was working for Airbnb, and now he is an uh, really just more like an optimization expert. He has a blog about it, writes all about this stuff. Uh, when I got into the space, when I first started, I followed uh, Danny's uh, content and used that in my own listing. And he, uh, his book is is just a gold mine of information. So I got him on the show. I know a lot of you guys have been asking about him. So without further ado, uh, Danny, what? please let the audience know a little bit more about who you are and what inspired you to get into short-term rentals. Yeah, sure. I, so I'm Danny, and I, I first heard of Airbnb in 2012, about eight, eight years ago. And through a process of working at Airbnb and then working through an Airbnb property management company, and then starting my own Airbnb property management company, and then from there, uh, starting the optimization, which is the, the thing that I spend my most time on. That's like the brain. And then there's the, there's the book, there's the remote property management there's the blog and the YouTube and everything else. Now, what, what bef- before you started working at Airbnb, because this, this is kind of probably what started it all, uh, what, what brought you to that position? Oh, I hated my job, but I didn't know it at the time. So I quit without having another job lined up. This was back in uh, 2012, I think. And... You're not supposed to do that, especially when you have a prestigious, uh, I'm a CPA by, by trade. I'm still a CPA actually, but when you have a prestigious job and your family's happy and, and society thinks you're doing really good things, I just quit my job. Uh, we had two week break over Christmas and I just, it just like hit me. I was like, I'm, I just don't like it. I didn't know I hated it at the time. I knew I really didn't like it. And we were just coming into busy season. So this is like the last time that typically you're supposed to cancel because people need you. But I was just like, ah. I just can't do it. I don't want to. So I quit. And I heard of Airbnb through my job search at that time. I interviewed for Airbnb. They said no at first. I worked for another company. So my thought process was I was a public accountant. So I said, all right, I know I don't like my job. Maybe if I work for a private company in accounting, I'll like it. So I worked for a private company in accounting department uh, because Airbnb said no. When I went to Airbnb, I was like, ah, this is, I will work here. They said no the first time. I stayed in touch, worked for a different company. Didn't like that job equally. 
did not like both jobs equally. So then my thought process was, okay, so I don't like accounting, public accounting. I don't like accounting at a private company. Maybe it's, I need to like the actual company. And that's the, that's the missing piece. So I was like, I like Airbnb. I travel like this anyways. It, it clicked for me. People back then were like, there's a famous quote where Brian Chesky, the CEO, was telling one of his idols about his idea. And his idol said something to the effect of like, I hope that's not your only idea you're working on. And he didn't get it. I got it right away. Someone told me I got it right away. It makes sense. So I stayed in touch with Airbnb a few months, three, four or five months later. Uh, the recruiter said, hey, we got a, another job, different, different position, same team. So they said, you want to interview for it? I said, yes. So I did. And uh, after like some like 18 interviews in like two weeks, uh, the, the, the prior job must have known because there's only so many doctor's appointments and calling in six and have to, you know, pick your brother up. You can do in a two week period without being found out. And they said, yes. And, I, and that's how I got worked weaseled my way into Airbnb. So you're, you're working uh, at Airbnb. What, what, what year was this when you started working with them? 2013. 2013. 700th employee, right around the 700th. So, so you saw, you saw Airbnb um, really like at, it, it, at that point, where was Airbnb as far as like the, the growth? Because Airbnb started 2008, 2013. Uh, where, where was it around there? The valuation was $8 billion. But it was significantly less known than that. That's, that is a big company, but people in San Francisco, a lot of people in San Francisco, most people in San Francisco at this time, this was before the politics started, didn't, hear, didn't know about Airbnb. Uh, even nowadays, I was just in Argentina and I, and I was taking an Uber ride. Uber is very similar to Airbnb. You would think if you heard of Uber, especially if you're an Uber driver, you probably would have heard of Airbnb. No, he was like, Air what? It brings me back to the days when I, in 2013, when I ordered packages, I was at Airbnb office all the time. So when I had to order packages, I got them to Airbnb and I'd be like, you know, Airbnb headquarters. Um, and they'd be like, what? And I'd be like, A, I, R. I'm sure it's the same thing that happens. Like a lot, like Google, all these companies, like go what? G O O. And then eventually everyone knows about it. Uh, back then the, the unaided awareness so if you just, uh, if you just, if you didn't say what it was, if you just like put a logo in front, the unaided awareness was at 6%, only 6% of the U S population. So no one knew about this thing. I even think today, very few people know about this thing. When they go public next year, where they just announced this will be for, this will be bigger than it is for most companies because like Google, everyone uses search Uber, pretty much everyone needs that. But Airbnb only if you have extra space only if you travel and a lot of people don't travel the vast majority of people don't travel um so yeah i was there pretty early on maybe a year after that the politics started happening and, and like the city of san francisco everyone knew about it but like i said even nowadays a lot of people never heard the word airbnb before and it's a 30 well it's a 30 35 billion company i believe it's four times that amount at this at this time today. Yeah, that, that that's really hopeful for a lot of people getting into the space because they're thinking, oh man, everybody's making money, everybody's getting into this. How am I supposed to, you know, get my listing up there and be able to do well? And uh, perfect guy for that. We have the optimizer on the show. So uh, what from that point, so you started working at Airbnb, uh, uh, what what made you leave and want to kind of venture out on your own? Nothing made me want to leave. I was fired. I was on the right bus. I was just thinking about this for the call because it always comes up. I was on, I was on, I was in the wrong seat on the right bus. So after those two years, pretty quickly after I arrived, I realized, okay, so now I'm at a company that I love. I'm with a team that is awesome, but I'm still doing accounting. So it's that third, I'm still, it's accounting. It's not, it's accounting that I don't like. So eventually it caught up with me. Uh, no, no real good story there. Just like I said, wrong seat, right bus, not making any mistakes, but such a competitive team, such a growth growing company. You need to like put in more than the bare minimums and at a job you don't like, it's like, man, it's hard to put in more than bare minimums. Uh, in fact, when I would work home, work, work at home from air, when I was at Airbnb, I really wouldn't do anything, but I'd play that game where I was like signed on to the computer just to make them think I was working. 
because it was so hard. I would do anything. I'd clean the house, work out, anything, anything. Call my parents <laughs> besides work. And I was like, yeah, you know, I just can't work from home. Nowadays, oh, I'm talking to you from my home. Well, from someone else's home, but from my home at the moment. Uh, and actually, it turns out I'm so much more productive and so much more enjoyable working at home. It wasn't, it wasn't the working at home. It was the type of work that I was doing that I didn't like. Now, so, so you, you, you finally found this, this thing that you love. You, you, you love working from home you, 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 uh, within that space, uh, you know, that process of, uh, you know, cutting out. What, what about staying? So after you got fired, what, what made you want to stay in the space? And how did you kind of discover the optimization for uh, Airbnb short-term rentals was where you were more passionate about? It starts one step before that. So I'm, a, I'm an accountant. I'm in the accounting department. Uh, I'm, have you ever had a, de- a desk job before? Yeah. So what does the company think? I mean, what kind of reputation does the accounting department and the accounting folks have? Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of the, the bottom of the barrel. Like, ugh, don't, don't, don't really want to mess with those guys. Those guys are kind of like, I don't know, <laughs> not, yeah, like, not, the, not the great, not the greatest view. <laughs> Yeah, like, like, yeah, like they're like, they're viewed as like a cost center, heads down, bean counters, just sitting at their desk, working all day long, eating lunch, eating dinner at their desk. Well, in my case, eating lunch at dinner at their desk. Most people just lunch. So, uh, and that's, that's the reputation we have. Uh, but there was just a few months before I got fired, there was a promotion and it was, you refer someone, a host, you get 500 bucks, they get 500 bucks. So I heard this at the company meeting. I was like, whoa, 500 bucks. That was, first of all, whenever there was any kind of experiments going on with the user interface, when I was at Airbnb, I was a host. So whenever there was any experiments, I was like, I'll do it. <laughs> Anything besides my job. Oh yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. And it, I did want to do it as well. And so there was a promotion. And as soon as I heard it, I was like, I'm doing that. That makes a lot of sense. So through that promotion, I met a property manager, local property manager. And that's how, when, when I was fired, I, I walked out on that Monday afternoon and I felt like, I felt good actually. It was weird. I didn't have a job and I'd just been fired, but I felt like a weight was lifted. I was like, you know that feeling in college when you have finals and then just after fi- that last final, you're like, you don't have a job. You don't have any classes. You're like 100% free. Like, what should I do? That's how I felt. Um, and so, uh, and by the way, I left with $15,000 in Airbnb credit. I was number one. I referred 36, I think, people. The next best was 12. So that's where I kind of knew inside me I was more than an accountant. I was different. So that was kind of the first, the first, um, uh, uh, what is the thing? Tipping, the tipping point. And the, all the, all the them fall down. I'm forgetting the word. Yeah. The, uh, the domino effect. Domino. Yeah. That was the first domino. I was like, not only did I get number one, but I'm an accountant. And so people actually took notice in the company. And this is why I was hired back just a few weeks later at, at, in a limited role in a, in a marketing type role in San Francisco. And I finished after that six month, eight month thing, I finished number one in that class in all every category as well. And at this time, I was working for the short-term property manager. I was now doing business development. I was securing deals with the cleaning team. I was uh, figuring out processes for when things go wrong and everything. And this is when it all kind of clicked. I know I'm, I'm doing something different than accounting. I love it. And through the, air, the short-term property manager, my salary was based partly on my bonus, which was, part, which was based on revenue. So if we had a crappy listing, I would tweak some things. It'd make the host happy. It'd make the owner happy. It'd make me happy because I get money. And eventually I started realizing like, oh, I'm changing like things. And sometimes within three hours, one hour, a booking would come in. And it doesn't take too many of those to be with a crappy listing to be like, oh, wait a minute, there's something here. Now, now, how did how does a, a a CPA that that really didn't have too too much experience um, with like you know SEO or optimization be able to figure out like this if I tweak this thing it's gonna have this type of result? Oh, money! I'm very good with money. I've always been very good with money. So my bonus was based on how how much money the company makes. So I had my pulse right on how much money we were making. 
And the more money I was able to make it, I also brought in, I tripled the amount of listings they had. They had like something around 20 when I left, they had something around 70. So I brought in a bunch of listings in that year. So I just thought of ways, how can I make more money? How can I make more money? I can bring in more listings, yeah. But with the existing listings, I can also make, make them more money. How about pricing the calendar? And, but specifically with the tweaking, the title, the photos, uh, there was a point where I would go. Photos are, I realized photos were so important. So I had a team. I hired a team around me at this company. But I knew photos were so important that I insisted on being there in person for every photo shoot. I would lay out the house. I wouldn't take the photos, but I would, I would, I would uh, lay out the house and I would tell the photographer, okay, take this, take that, take that. Was it because of your experience working at Airbnb that you knew like these are the things that they're looking for? Or how, how did you know like these are the types of uh, photos, these are the types of um, results that would, would impact uh, how, how profitable a property would be? Well, clearly I was at Airbnb and I was doing a bunch of experiments, any kind of um, UI test, user interface, user experience testing. Anytime I could get and do that stuff, I was in there. So there was some sort of a foundation for sure. I was in the company. I was hearing what the founders were saying. I was seeing the changes that were being discussed and whatnot. So at some level, yeah, it was kind of internalized. But I feel like I learned about all this stuff through trial and error after the fact when I was not doing accounting for Airbnb, but when I was being a property manager. And keep in mind, when I was doing the property management for eight of the months, that first year I did property management after Airbnb, for eight of those months, I was still working for Airbnb was paying me. And I was in the Airbnb offices twice, once to three times a week. Now, you said that you liked being at the properties uh, when you were taking the photos. Uh, you wrote, you wrote uh, the book optimize optimize my uh, B and B previously optimize my Airbnb, um, but a book is optimize your B&B. optimize your B and B optimize your B and B optimize my B and B. Okay, okay, optimize your B and B. Um, but you you wanted to be at the properties to view and kind of have oversight. Did you figure out like a way for other people, even just reading a book, to be able to, um, you know have their photos because photos are very, it's very, um, personal. Like, you know, it's, it's, it, it's hard to maybe distill the, um, uh, the artistic creative ability of, of, uh, you know, telling someone that, Hey, you should take this type of photo down to, you know, words on a page. How, how are you able to do that? And the short answer is no, I haven't found a way to do that because it's, it's half science. There's, there's half, you know, don't do a close up of the ornament on the, the dining table. That's like a fact. Don't ever do that. But the other 50% is art. And I haven't, I don't know. I just, I think I have a knack for it. I have, I have a helper who helps me a little bit with the reports, downloads photos and whatnot. And he, te- he, he, I, he uh, tells me if they're professionally taken or not. And sometimes for me, it's just, I know right away if it's professional taken, but sometimes, and he knows like, 90% of the time, but there's some times where he's not sure if it's professional or not professional photo. And for me, I can just tell right away. And the photo layout is different. The angles are different. Uh, so some listings have like four angles of the same room. Well, I haven't been able to really figure out, like pull out the facts in my brain to figure out, well, why exactly am I taking this, these two angles or why just one angle this time and two angles that time? It all kind of fits into the to the whole experience, but yeah. Short answer is I don't really have a answer for that. Now, as you're working on this and and kind of fine tuning your your skill, um, when when did it come to the point where it's like okay, I can I can really be able to you know do this and and create a system and and write a book about this to be able to help other people and and now you're 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 doing this on your own. What, how how did that progression take place? That progression was pretty quick. Um, I knew right away I could do this for other people. And so uh, I sold my first one in, I think, June 2016. It was five bucks and it took me about 45 minutes. And it's worked up nowadays, it's $300. And the first in August, uh, airbnbguide.com, they were the first ones to 
Uh, so back then, I would reach out to everyone and I would say, hey, I'm prior Airbnb employee. I'm starting this business. And he was the first one to promote me to his list. And he was rather large. And I remember in August, a few people bought me. At that time, it was 100 bucks. I think it was 100 bucks or 99 bucks. And a few people bought the service. And I remember thinking like, whoa, this, these random people just paid another random person on the internet who says he can do something. Um, and so that, since then, it just took off. I wrote a ton of blog posts and just reached out to everyone, reached out to media uh, and so, and refi- I still refine the, the, the report. Maybe once every two months, I'll add in a, a, a dozen changes to it. Very cool. And, and so, so you really kind of found where your, uh, your passion was with, uh, with the creative aspect, the, you know, the optimization. Um, and then you also started taking some properties under yourself, what, uh, taking those properties. Um, how, how has that been able to afford, um, your lifestyle now? I was going to start the first, the initial plan was to create a property management company and create a huge one and create the, the world's best property, Airbnb property management company. But I realized pretty quickly, as soon as I left for the one weekend, that I didn't want to do this because I can't leave. It's too much work. I have to deal with hosts. I have to deal with guests. I have to deal with Airbnb. I have to deal with maintenance folks. I was like, I, don't, I knew I didn't want to do this. When I was working at the other company, uh, I guess I was, she was taking care of a lot of the sales and customer service with hosts and whatnot, and I was working on making her money. So I pivoted to the optimized business, but I kept, I kept the, the property management website, and actually it does tremendously well. I get inquiries daily almost, and I forward them to people who, uh, well, one or two people actually, who are my preferred people in the, uh, in the Bay Area. Most of them come from the Bay Area, but I also mention it a couple of times in the book and people come to me through the book. Um, and I, right now I have six properties. I say on my website, I, want, I, don't, I don't serve more than five at a time because I'm not focused on property management. I'm focused on optimization, writing articles, creating videos, getting my information out. But I like to have a foot in the property management game. I can test my strategies until I get my own properties, which will be next year, hopefully, in Medellin. Uh, and that's, that's, that's how it works. Uh, since then, I, I get inquiries, like I said, from, the web, from just organic, from Yelp. I have really positive, lengthy reviews from prior hosts who I've worked with. And that's what's, that's what's helped me keep myself in the property management game. It's actually been quite easy. I refer out 95% of inquiries that come in. Now, what, what are the biggest things, um, because you, you get a lot of people coming to you wanting to have their listings optimized. What are the biggest things that people are having problems with that you're able to quickly um, resolve? Like what, what is something that without you having to look at it, if that you can just tell someone and they can be like, they can easily change that and then their, their listing will do a lot better. Oh, if I, if I didn't see the listing, if someone just come to me, let's say we're at like some sort of a, an event venue and they say, hey, my listing is doing, it's the same thing. I'm not making enough money. Sometimes it's, I'm not getting enough views, but it's, that is also I'm not making enough money. Views don't matter. So if I didn't see the listing and they didn't say anything else than that, I would say this one thing. It would probably be um, text. Their text. Their photos, text, and title are the most important. A lot of people have professional photos. They just don't have the right layout and they have too many photos. But almost always, unless they've seen me, my stuff, almost always the text is really poorly done. It's in big blurbs of block text. It's got too much flowery, fluffy text in there. Uh, and this is, it's like the third thing the guest sees, but I think this is really important for my conversion rate. Now, what, what type of text should someone be having in their listing? You said you don't want fluff. You don't want big blocks of text. How, how, how do you want a listing's text to be able to attract uh, clients? My strategy is treat people like the big news media treats them and Facebook treats them. People have short attention spans. And so you have to grab their attention and you have to keep it. And how, how I do that 
is I tell them what they're getting in bullet point format, very easy to consume and absorb. That's it. It's as easy as that. And going from the top, you said that the the photos, uh, not to put too, too many photos in there, is there um, cause I know Airbnb likes to have people include as, as many photos as you can, but you're saying that you shouldn't put too, too many photos. What, what, what type of photos are you, uh, trying to put in there? So I, the absolute minimum is 10, probably like 12 as I'm more comfortable with really small houses, studios. It's hard to fit 12 in without repeating information. In this case, I would take neighborhood photos. I have a blog about that. There is an art and there's a way to optimize neighborhood photos. And I think most people should have at least one neighborhood photo, but uh, at least 12 photos. And you really don't need... Airbnb does say... They they seem to hint that more photos is better. I don't buy it. Um, I don't buy it. I'm more concerned about the conversion rate. So you don't have to take... I'm in my kitchen right now. You don't have to take five angles of the kitchen. You just have to take one angle that gets 90% of it in. If you can't do that, then do two photos. But I'm never having more than two photos per room. Two photos of this living room would have normally one photo, but they have a hammock. So if I would do two photos here to definitely include the hammock. Um, a lot of people do four angles of the bedroom. You don't need that. You need one angle with a bedroom and then another, like if it's a, if it's a room here, You'll do one angle here and then one angle, one angle here. So you get both, you get both corners and the sides of the walls. You get everything in just two photos from different sides. Now, yeah, like this. For the for the people that are listening on the on the podcast, this might be a little bit oh. difficult to visualize, but on YouTube, <laughs> you, you can see Danny's Danny's hand hand gestures. Yeah, uh, yes, so definitely graphics in there on the YouTube. In the, <laughs> Yeah, and for the for the blog for the um, podcast folks, just you're gonna go to two, the opposite corners of the room, and you're gonna shoot in kind of a similar angle. So you get in each in each photo, you get like two 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 walls, two opposing walls. Now going down, the next thing would be the title. Um, what do you what do you see the being the biggest issues that uh, most people have common when they are putting in their titles, and and what is the the optimized way of doing that? Yeah, titles is another one where basically everyone gets it wrong. I just did it. I have a blog post on my website. It's one of my most popular ones, and I just did an accompanying Airbnb quick tip, which I do once a week, five minutes or less, about the same subject. And the, the, the things that I would say, remove any generic words, like the 80-20 principle, I would say remove any generic words, add in amenities that you're offering, add in an emoji of some sort to catch more people's eyeballs and attention. And then you're going to set yourself apart from the 90% of listings who say two bedroom, one bathroom in Sunset District, San Francisco or whatever. The funny thing is I did, uh, I rented an Airbnb plus in, uh, Buenos Aires and they had the neighborhood in the Airbnb plus title and the host loses control of this. Um, I'm convinced it's just some, some random employee is controlling this and they just give them kind of guidelines and that's that they're already in plus. So it doesn't matter. Um, putting the neighborhood in most of the time, doesn't make sense. Either they've already heard about it because it's very famous or they've never heard about it. Neither of which it makes sense to include it. So when people are searching on Airbnb, they're not looking for a specific neighborhood. They're looking more for like amenities. Um, is, that, is that what you're saying? No, I'm not saying that. If someone is, let's say, so when I went to Buenos Aires, I already knew Palermo is like the premier neighborhood. So if there's the first neighborhood you're going to hear about, it's going to be Palermo probably. So yeah, I indeed typed in Palermo neighborhood. But that takes me to the neighborhood of Palermo, which is, it's rather not focused. So I specifically, I've been traveling a lot, so I know exactly where I want to stay. But um, it's not, a lot of people have Palermo in their title, but it's not, so, so having Palermo in your title isn't going to bring you to first of the list. It's bringing, it's bringing you to the neighborhood, not to a listing. So, so people think that by putting uh, the specific location in their title, that that'll help uh, with the optimization, almost like you were to put into Google, like, it, you know, Palermo Airbnbs, they would think because that's in their title that it would come up as number one, but you're saying that's not true? 
Exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. And I wrote an article about how and why Airbnb is not Google. There's significant differences. Airbnb is not Google. There's a lot of SEO people who try and get into the Airbnb space. And they're like, yeah, use the keywords. Beef up the text. Use the keywords, man. And I'm like, no, it doesn't work like that on Airbnb. Um, it might. Airbnb's never said it. It might rank them higher, maybe. Uh, maybe they're one spot. Let's say it works. So maybe they're a one or two spots higher than me. But my conversion rate is going to be way higher than theirs because I'm giving them the facts. What are they getting? I'm getting excited. Oh, I get, oh, Netflix. Cool. Oh, I get a hammock in the, in the living room. In, indoor hammock. Oh, cool. I get a balcony. Cool. The other listing, the keyword, the keyword beefing, the, the beefy keyword guys, I got to read a paragraph and pick out, okay, Netflix, hammock, indoor hammock, balcony. I've, I've stopped reading here, so all I see is Netflix. So, so really what it sounds like, everything from the photo, the photo has to be a hook, the title has to be a hook, and then the description has to be a hook. It's not so much about what specifically you're putting in there. It's just how can you attract uh, your certain ideal client is kind of what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. I would say to sum it up, deliver the most amount of information to the guest in the least amount of time. Now, do, is there, do you also uh, work on like the house rules and house manual? Is that stuff that you are also trying to optimize? Does that matter for conversions? Like how many house rules you have in your listing or, you know, um, uh, what, you know, if you're putting a spare air mattress in the room or a pullout couch, is that stuff also put into consideration? Oh, everything you said is put into consideration. The house rules is an interesting point because I do... It's a, it's a sensitive area. It's a legal, legal type area. So I don't mess with it too much, though I do a little bit. Like if someone adds in checkout instructions on the additional rules, I'll just remove that right away. It's totally unnecessary. And I'll add it to the house manual in the back end after they book. Um, but uh, I, I do think from my own house rules, from my own experience, I get people who ask me about on what one of my house rules is, hey, uh, I require guests to have travels insurance. It protects them for lost luggage, canceled flights, etc. And every now and then someone will ask me about this. So guests read it. It's pretty prominent. If you've ever been a guest, I'm sure um, most of your listeners have. If you've ever been a guest, when you click out, they, they highlight the rules. They don't make you click anything off, but the rules are very highlighted. These are the house rules. I recommend you highlight the important house rules. A lot of people have like a legal contract in there. Well, I guess that protects you, but no one's reading that. And if you have some real like important house rules, guests are missing them. So if you go with that big legalese type contract, pull out the really important rules, make it stupid people language and put it all the way at the top. So we, we've covered some of the, you know, when, I, when I'm thinking of optimizing a listing, I am thinking of, you know, the photos, I'm thinking of the title, I'm thinking of the description. Are there other things that that host should be thinking of or that host should be considering um, that maybe they aren't really as aware of that they should be optimizing? Yes. The first thing is when Airbnb adds in um, selections in the back end, new, new features, you should take advantage of these right away. Tell the system, okay, you think Airbnb is dumb? They said a while ago, changing your calendars makes you rank high. So that's true. It still does that. But I get questions all the time. There are people are so worried about, oh, I'm going to connect to the smart price or that'll, that'll fix my issues. Well, no, Airbnb knows that nowadays. It's just like travel hacking. Like I think travel hacking is a waste of time. It used to be cool, but it's, they figured it out now, though, the airline industries. You need to dedicate a lot of resources to make that work. So yeah, uh, changing your calendar every day works, but to a small, to what degree? Probably very small. There is a new feature in the back end called accessibility. So what I'm saying is, yeah, do the calendar, but also uh, if there's two listings and one is doing the calendar every day, well, both are doing the calendar every day, and then they add in accessibility features like they have, and this listing fills out the accessibility features, well, okay, uh, we recognize that this automatic tool is doing the calendars. This guy's going in manually. Okay, we're going to bump him up. Additionally, he's, they're getting, you know, he's getting good reviews and whatnot. So there's that, I would say, for your listeners. Go in there. Um, you might not have to click anything off, but go in there and, and see if you can. There's probably something. There's a lot of options on there. 
they added a new section on photos where you, you identify the spaces that you have available, dining space, living room, patio, garage, ex- exterior, and then you assign photos to those spaces. Uh, I go, go and do those. Those things matter as, long, as well as everything else, but those things as well matter. And those are, those are kind of the two, is, two newest things that Airbnb has added. With the calendar, I mean, that, that can be pretty t- tedious and especially because a lot of our listeners are property managers um, to go in and change the, the, the pricing of every single listing. Can, can that be replaced by just using a dynamic pricing to automatically adjust it? Or does Airbnb know like, hey, you're not actually physically going in and changing this by a dollar or, or whatever? Oh, well, they don't know, but they do know you can predict behavior. If, the, if they're changing the calendar by this amount every day at 12.37 you know, a.m., it's pretty obvious. But I really think it has a small degree of importance. Uh, go, to, go to, so for your property managers, your hosts with one, two, three, five homes, any homes, go to pricelabs.co, uh, sign up for the 30-day free trial, enter in, uh, in I think all capitals, optimize. You'll get a little discount on your first month. I think it's like 15 or 20 bucks per listing and it gets cheaper with each added listing. If your listing is more than about 80 bucks a night, 70 or 80 bucks a night, depending on your occupancy, it will, be, it will, it will work out cheaper than the other services like Beyond Pricing and Wheelhouse who charge 1% of your revenue. And then after you do that, go to my YouTube and type in, um, go to the playlist Price Labs and I have, what I do is on Wednesday, I go in and I look at my occupancy, my future occupancy and my base rate, and I change it. And I go through that process in my head. I, I verbalize what's in my head and how I do things. And, and they have a lot of customizations, but I keep it simple at the beginning. All you do is this. There's all these other customizations. I have another video. Once you get into those customizations, I have them broken down, the 12 or so customizations they have. But uh, don't use Airbnb Smart Pricing use price labs with price labs um so even even though you 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 recommend going into the calendars yourself you you also still recommend using a dynamic pricing for those people that have multiple listings oh if you use a dynamic pricing they update your calendar themselves so it takes care of the automatic updating that i mentioned earlier okay okay i, I was just clarifying because we um uh, i um I, I thought when you said that the dynamic pricing they um, Airbnb knows that it's automatically doing it, so they 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 kind of frown frown upon that. No, they definitely don't frown upon it. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to keep your calendar updated. The last thing Airbnb wants is someone that just happened to me. This calendar is open in August. I inquired with the host, and he said no, it's not available. So he blocked the days off. But I really want this wanted this listing. I waited a few months. I just inquired last week. Dates were open, like perfect dates, November 9th. I was like, oh, great. November 9th, I inquired. He's like, I got to check. The next morning, he's like, no, I'm not available. So everybody doesn't want that. They want you to be updating your calendar. And that hurt. this is hurting the host. He just got two requests for one month each. That's a lot of money for Airbnb, the company. So this host is losing Airbnb, the company, money. What, what would you say, like all this, all this back end? So we, we have the calendars. Uh, you said opting into the, um, the new settings that Airbnb offers. What about, what about the types of restriction that, that you're putting? I know that, um, you know, like if you could set it for flexible or, or very strict, does that matter as well for how your listing is going to be optimized? Yeah, pretty much everything matters. But as you just touched on the, the cancellation policy, I believe that Though Airbnb's never said it, I believe that they give a boost to flexible. They've done enough testing and, and how they, I can, I can see how the platform is moving. They seem to preference flexible listings. I highly recommend that. There's only one listing that I have, which I don't have flexible, uh, one out of six, because it just, it just seemed to attract uh, crap guests and had a ton of cancellations. So that one's uh, moderate. I almost, I never recommend strict, moderate or flexible, go with flexible if at all possible. So we, we've, we've, we've covered all, all of these different aspects. What, what would you say though is the, the big, big things? Is it, is it just the photos, title, description that, that a host really should be aware of and then everything else is just kind of a little bit extra? Yeah, the 80-20 rule says photos, title, text, for sure. We've only talked about the online listing though. 
Airbnb, is, it's half the battle. The other half is your reviews, which are reflective of more so your hosting strategy, not your online listing. You get the reservation from your optimized listing. You get reviews from your hosting strategies and abilities. And that's a whole nother topic that we can do. We can do all, I'll, I'll be, a, I'll, I'll return in a few months and we can do that topic. But uh, the biggest thing there is, so uh, listen up, everyone who's listening, listen up now, turn, turn the volume up, uh, turn the TV off. Park or, the car. Yeah, park the car, whatever, uh, whatever you're doing extra. This is very important. It's very underutilized. It's a digital guidebook. Not to be confused with the guidebook in Airbnb, which is recommendations only. The digital guidebook is something that I send to the guest in a link after they, after they book, three days before they, they check in. I send them a link that says, here's your guidebook. The check-in information is here. Parking information. I say Wi-Fi information is here. So that means they have to click on it because it's the first thing that everyone wants to know. And this is underutilized. For example, I'm in a place now. It's beautiful. It's the best interior design place in the area for sure. Um, and the, ho- the host was very good. He's a super host. He has a... Um, uh, let's see if you can see that. See those papers on the wall next to the white bag? So those are his uh, manual house, house manual, uh, which is okay. It's, it's like level one. Level two, though, is a digital house manual uh, because... Um, you can make changes easier to it. Now, his looks nice. They're laminated and whatnot, but um, they're easily forgettable. Uh, you're, you're always referring... Well, often you're referring to the Airbnb app, and you, yeah, you can update it. And oftentimes, they don't look that good. They look kind of crappy after a while. Also, you can, you can include like uh, just one more thing. There's a bunch of more things, that's, but I feel like my argument wasn't strong enough, so I'll, I'll add one more thing. Um, you can also, with your recommendations, you can add in uh, directions right away. So here, oh, that sounds good. I'll go find it on my map and whatnot. In the digital guidebook, another thing you can do, which is big, adds the guest experience. However the guest experiences your city, that reflects in the review. Uh, they can just, they, they have it on their phone. They click the address, bring me there, bam, really easy. Very cool. Yeah. And I I love that you brought that point up. Optimization is there's the front end optimization, which is what's going to hook those people in. But then there's your back end optimization. So once they're in, how are you going to be able to create their experience enough and get those reviews so that it can boost your listing up? What what would you say that the reviews are? I mean, the reviews, obviously, that that's a big portion. But as far as your your front end versus your back end, uh, what's the weight on both of those? As far as your frequency rate, right? how how it's how it's going to how it's going to affect your listings performance from front end optimization versus versus back end optimization. Uh, for me, it's they're totally different worlds. They're like the front end is like before the review, before the reservation. That's how you get them, and then and then the back end is your hosting strategies. So it, first re- optimization of listing, you get the reservation good. Now your hosting strategies, you get the review. They're like, they're like totally different. If you have one and not the other, it's just not going to work. Now, when, when people are, um, uh, working with you, when you, when you are uh, working with them, just to clarify, you're not just working on front end optimization. You're also working on the back end optimization as well. How, how they're performing as uh, hosts. It depends. I have, I used to only do front end optimization through my optimization reports, startup advanced and super host. But after, you know, after a while went by, I realized, okay, um, these people need also the hosting strategies. So I created Elevate Host, which takes in, it's a super host package, which is the premium front end package. And then also I do things, I work on pricing. I create a digital guidebook for you. I set you up for automatic messages, coordinate with your cleaners, give you some other, give you an amenities checklist. These are the things that you should have. Um, so that's the full package. Very cool. And we'll, we'll, we'll get Danny on another show to talk more about the back end optimization. Um, but, uh, I don't want to take up too, too much more of your time because, uh, you, you are traveling, you are, you are a busy guy. Um, what I'm just curious for, for the listeners and myself, how is, um, Airbnb? Cause right now you're in, uh, Medellin, Colombia. Um, what, what is, how is Airbnb more like in the South America area? Is it, is it as popular as in the U S or what's, what's the, the, um, 
view on it, the stance, and how are the listings uh, in general? Like, how are people performing? It, Airbnb is more popular outside the U.S. than it is inside the U.S. So, uh, and you, did you, you you're talking about specifically about Latin America? Yes. Is that what you want me to hit on? So the the listings here, well, first of all, they're very cheap. I can rent a very nice house here in a service department with a balcony for uh, six, seven, eight, nine hundred dollars, thousand dollars, which is what I paid for my room bedroom in San Francisco. Um, it, it's it's comparable. It's comparable. Uh, some I would say the decor sometimes is lacking in these cities. Uh, that's what separates the hosts here. They're really nicely interior designed listings. Whereas in the U.S. and these more developed countries, pretty much most hosts have the interior design. The house looks nice. It's updated. It's modern. That would that would be the biggest difference I see. Okay, but as far as how people are are performing, is it is it uh, very competitive? Because a lot of the listeners on this show, they are very competitive. They they're all about optimizing. They're all about trying to you know get their their listing to the top. Is that do you get do you see the same type of um, uh, competitiveness down in uh, Colombia as well? Most of the people who buy from me are from the U.S., Canada, Australia, United Kingdom, uh, Ireland. You know these these European countries and uh, and uh, English speaking countries. Um, however, I think that has to do with the fact that my services are expensive. So this is why I've also I do free YouTube. Everything else is free. All my blogs are free. There, there's no secrets that I'm hiding. I've pretty much written about everything. Um, and then the book is also cheap. So uh, you don't need to pay me at all. And actually, I prefer you don't because I have plenty of business. I don't want any more. Everything's free out there. The only difference is at this point, you're paying for your time. If you, if you want to pay me, yeah, I can do it for you for sure. It would be expensive. But you, if you value your time that much, you pay me and I'll do it for you. If you have the time or you don't have the money, take some time and read my blog, watch the videos, read, read my book for sure. That's where I take everything from my blog and all my information and I organize it so that the organization is worth something. Uh, and then uh, apply, apply what you can to your own listing and then reach out to me. But only if you've made a con uh, conceit, conceited, concerted effort to do it yourself. Uh, because a lot of people reach out to me and they're like, I read your book. Can you like help me? And I'll look at their title the first thing. And it's like two bedroom, amazing, spacious light house, you know, uh, on the beach. And I'm like, no, you didn't, you didn't give me enough effort for me to spend my time working with you. So if you do that and then reach out to me on my website chat and you've made an effort, I can tell right away. Then I'll say, yeah, uh, this, 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 like tweak these three things. If it's just two or three things, I'll just tell you, do these things. Or, or if it's something more complicated, I'll send you a blog post or a YouTube video. Great. And I'll, I'll include uh, uh, Danny's website and the book down below. The book, definitely, uh, Danny lays it all, all out. Uh, it's one of the, one of the top, going to be probably one of the top rated uh, books on Amazon. Um, 128 reviews right now. So It is the top rated, top rated and most highlighted book on, Air, on Airbnb. It doesn't have the most reviews yet, but soon, but it's the highest rated. It is the highest rated. So that, that uh, it says, says a lot. And um, great. But I just want to thank you so much, Danny, for coming on here and educating the audience. Uh, you provide just so much tremendous value with the free content that you're putting out there on YouTube and the blog post and uh, uh, with the book as well. So um, everything that everybody needs, like Danny was saying, it's it's out there. It's out there. But it's what what do you value? If you value your time, then you you know, then, then maybe you don't want to have to go through a whole book and try to learn this. If you want one more personal coaching, it's out there, but uh, there, there is a cost with that. But Danny's taking the time out to give us this free resource, this free content for those of you that like to travel on the go and listen. So definitely want to thank him. Uh, send him a message, leave a comment down below in the video. If you have any questions, uh, you can reach out to me or Danny and uh, we'd be happy to help you guys out. But uh, without further ado, and uh, until next time, Host Nation, keep on hosting. Hope you host benefited from the show. If you found value, please go on over to iTunes, leave us a review, and let us know what you enjoy about the show. If you'd like to talk to hosts that have been featured in these episodes as well as the community, go on over to our Facebook group, The Host Nation.